Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I greet you today in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Pastor George Rowe, uh, pastor of the church here, the Chetwin Gospel Tabernacle, right here in beautiful Chetwin. Beautiful day. It's Thursday morning and uh, plus 25 on the outside. The birds are singing, the grass is green, the sky is blue, and everything is just absolutely great. Today I want to share with you from the Word of God, but before we do that, let me just take a moment to pray with you. Heavenly Father, we thank you today because we are alive and we recognize that all life comes from you. As we share from the Word today, we're just asking that the Holy Spirit will interpret the message from the Word to our hearts, and at the end of the presentation, we might feel that you have spoken to us directly through the Word, particularly to the fathers today who will hear this message. I would ask that it would encourage them, it would bless them, and it would be an incentive to be even a better father or a better parent. Bless the Word, in Christ's name we pray, amen and amen. This is Thursday morning, but you'll be watching this video probably on Sunday morning, which will be June the 21st, which is Father's Day. And uh, I want to take this opportunity to wish all of you a great Father's Day. Enjoy it, and God's blessings upon you. We're going to talk a little bit about David today. I'm not going to preach at you, but I'm going to talk a little bit about David and being the king and at the same time being a father. And I'm going to talk about the subject, though I'm not going to use it a lot, the kiss that came too late. It's an interesting phrase. And let me just read you, uh, to you from 2 Samuel chapter 14 and verse 28. If you have your Bible, if you want to go find a Bible, please do that. And here's what it says, Absalom lived two years in Jerusalem without seeing the king's face. Then Absalom sent for Joab in order to send him to the king, but Joab refused to come to him, so we sent a second time, but he refused to come. Then he said to his servants, Look, Joab's field is next to mine, and he has barley there. Go and set it on fire. So Absalom's servants set the field on fire. Then Joab did go to Absalom's house, and he said to him, Why have your servants set my field on fire? And Absalom said to Joab, Look, I sent word to you and said, Come here, so I can send you to the king to ask, Why have I come from Geshur? It would be better for me if I were still there. Now then, I want you to see the king's face, and if I am guilty of anything, let me be put to death. So Joab went to the king and told him this. Then the king summoned Absalom, and he came in, and he bowed down with his face to the ground before the king. And the king kissed. Solomon. Thus the title of the message today, The Kiss That Came Too Late. There's a great catastrophe in the life of David, and you will remember the story of Bathsheba. And uh, he had been confronted by Nathan the prophet and reminded of the fact that what he did was a blatant sin against God. And David in his heart felt that, yes, I have sinned. And what I've done is absolutely and totally wrong. And he said to Nathan the prophet, he said, I have sinned against the Lord. And, and later on in Psalm 51, David recognizes it again. And then that beautiful psalm, he says, against you and you only have I sinned. So he's holding up to the fact that what he did was wrong. And so as the conversation continued between Nathan and David about the, the sin with Bathsheba, the prophet said 
to David the king, the Lord has taken away your sin. And we say a big amen to that. The prophet said, you are not going to die. But here is a real kicker that really got to the heart of David. Nathan said, the son born to you will die. David must face the consequences of his sin. I might ask the question, what has happened to this great man of God, this giant of a man, the anointed king of Israel? Why, when David was but a boy, he was anointed to become the future king of Israel. And the Bible says of that anointing, and from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David in great power. And here he is confessing that he has sinned against the Lord. In fact, on two occasions in the Bible, David is referenced as a man after God's own heart. Question, can David now regain traction? Can he still be the promising king of Israel that will bring stability to the nation, but at the same time bring glory and praise and honor to Almighty God? Well, following the death of his son and the sin between him and Bathsheba and the confrontation with Nathan, something has happened. David seemed to have been reconciled with himself, with the situation, and he lay with his wife Bathsheba, and she conceived and gave birth to another son. And for a while, things were going along pretty well. David was reestablishing himself as the king and as a father. But as we move the narrative up to 2 Samuel 13, we are introduced to a new phase in the life of King David. And we focus upon him not so much as the king of Israel, not so much as a great military leader, not so much as the rich man sitting on a gold throne, but we want to look at David as a father, as a father figurehead. David is in a very prominent position as the king, but he is also a husband, and he's a father. So the question is, how does the king balance the business of the throne with the business of being a father? Might I ask generally, how can any of us as fathers or as parents balance our professionalism with that of being a father, being a parent, being a friend to our sons? and our daughters. David is about to face another very difficult situation as the king, but more importantly, a very difficult situation as a father. It's a graphic story, and it's a difficult story to tell, but it's an actual fact of history that reminds us that we're all capable of doing something that is wrong. And the Bible says about the life of David, as things began to generally move forward, we jump into 2 Samuel, and it says, in the course of time, which means that David and his family are now entering into a new phase of family life that will stretch boundaries almost beyond normal capacity. He is about to face a situation that only the grace of God is going to be able to bring him through. And here is the background. David's son, Amnon, 
fell in love with his half-sister Tamar. Some call her Tamar. I'll call her Tamar. And through the manipulation of his friend Jonadab, Tamar was invited into the bedroom of Amnon under the false pretenses that he was very, very sick. And he wanted his sister to literally feed him from hand to mouth. He had a deep, lustful desire to be with his own sister. And so word came to the king that his son was ill. And he said to his daughter, David said to his daughter, not aware of his son's scheme, he said, go to the house of your brother Amnon and prepare some food for him. And the Bible goes on to say, but when she took the food for him to eat, he grabbed her and said, come to bed with me, my sister. That in itself is a difficult thing to say and to repeat. And Tamar pleaded with her brother, cried with her brother not to defile her because of the disgrace that it would bring to her personally and bring to the family in particular. But Amnon was obsessed, and he was determined and desirous to have a sexual, lustful relationship with his sister. And the Bible says, but he refused to listen to her, and since he was stronger than her, he raped her. What a sad commentary in the life of two individuals. So sad. And, and when the atrocity had reached the ears of Absalom, who was the brother of Tamar, he immediately began to make plans in his mind and in his spirit to bring retribution against Ammonon for this great sin against his own family, his own flesh and blood. And, and so the Bible says of Absalom, he hated Ammonon because he had disgraced his sister Tamar. Interesting story. So a party of three family members will now change the course of history forever. That's right. The household of the king, King David, will never be the same. This man of God, who was endowed with the power of the Holy Spirit when he was anointed as king as a boy, is now going to face one of the most difficult challenges in his life as a father and as a parent. So what was the king's reaction? What was David's reaction when news had gotten back to him what had taken place? It was simply this. When David heard this, he was furious. Now remember, he's the king, and he's the father of those three kids. And his reaction was, he was furious. But you know, ladies and gentlemen, being furious is not enough. Hear me. Being furious at what had happened was in itself not enough. At this point in the family, the family tragedy, the king, the father, should have exercised his rights, his privileges, and his responsibility as the father. The father, not the king, ought to have gathered the children together and worked through the situation. Absalom already hates his brother Amnon, and the only emotion 
that the king shows is that he is furious. Is he furious just because of the situation? Is he furious with Absalom? Is he furious with his daughter? The Bible really doesn't say, but at that point in time, the fatherly instincts ought to have kicked in. And his immediate response ought to have been to, to gather his children around him and to resolve this embarrassing situation. Well, the incident is for all intents and purposes, as far as the king is concerned, is kind of kind of put to the side and and two years since the rape has now passed. Two years have drifted by, and the incest, the brokenness of the family will continue to become even more intense as we continue to read in the Word. Fathers, I, I, I'm a father, I'm a grandfather, I'm a great-grandfather, but who amongst us have not faced intense moments in our families where the regular business of the day must be put aside to deal with the emergencies of the moment. If I might become a little personal, I, I came from a family of 15 children back in Newfoundland. And my dad was a born-again Christian, and every child that came into the world to mom and dad, they were a blessing. And dad was a busy, busy man. Worked hard all of his life. Made sure that his kids were raised in a spiritual environment. Always conducted family devotions. He didn't drive us to church. He took us to church. And whenever I had a problem, whenever I faced a difficult time in my life, I knew I could go to my dad and I would sit down, and I could talk with him, and together as a team of two people, we were able to come through the situation, get an understanding, feel that we loved each other, and then continued to move on. The king, the father, ought to have stepped in a little earlier. Let me just say this. The thing that don't get dealt with when it should, it festers, and a seed of bitterness produces poisonous fruit. Could, could I just say that again? The thing that don't get dealt with when it should, it festers, and a seed of bitterness produces poisonous fruit. And this is exactly what is happening in the life of Absalom. You see, hatred is a very strong thing. It's a very strong emotion. And hatred toward Ammonon has now reached a point of no return. One would have thunk that after two years, Absalom would have forgotten and would have moved on. But instead, after two years, Absalom brings his plan together so that he might annihilate his brother because of what he did. And so the season has come where all of the sheep shearers gather together to have a party. And, and Absalom's ultimate goal is to get rid of his brother. And so he invites King David to come, his own dad. Daddy is invited to come to the party. But David, for some reason, refused the invitation. And here's what Absalom did. Even though he had ulterior motives, he said to the father, he said, if not, saying to his dad, if not, please let my brother Ammonon Come with us. And in addition to the king sending Ammon to the feast, he also sent the rest of his sons. 
David was completely unaware. He was almost detached from the situation. And he was totally unaware that when his son had gone to the party, this would be the last festive time that Ammonid would enjoy. And Absalom said to his servants, when my brother becomes intoxicated, when he is almost out of his mind because of alcohol, I want you to kill him. Imagine the intent was so vicious in the life of this young man that he was prepared in the front of many witnesses at the height of a festive party. He was prepared to take the life of his own brother. And you wonder sometimes if this was not just animosity between him and his brother or if it had anything to do with his sister. He was at a point where to annihilate Ammon was the only goal right now. Question. When I think of the invitation of Daddy to come to the festival, I wonder what would have happened if David had accepted the invitation. If David had said, yeah, son, I will come. I will celebrate. Like in today's standing, we would say to our son, our children, yeah, I'll come to the ball game. I'll come to the hockey game. I'll come to your party. I'll come to your graduation. I want to be a part of the festivities. But David's heart wasn't into it. Maybe he was still thinking about the atrocity with his son and with his daughter. If the father had accepted the invitation, could he not have intervened and possibly even preserved the life of Amnon? Would it be a deterrent for the servants to carry out the deed to kill the king's son? I guess we'll never know. But Amnon had been murdered. News had gotten back to the king. Absalom feared for his life and escaped to a town called Gersher, where he stayed for three long years. Now, here's the amazing thing. The Bible says, but King David mourned for his son every day. You see, the love of the father is still there. The affection of the father is still there. The atrocity that Absalom committed was wrong, just as the sin with the king and Bathsheba was wrong. But he didn't stop loving Bathsheba, and he didn't stop loving his son Absalom. And every day for three years, he mourned for his son. Remember, David's first reaction to what Ammon did was furious. The only emotion, he was furious. His reaction to his son being murdered was a spirit of sackcloth, ashes, and mourning. And, and the Bible says, and King David now reconciled to Ammonon's death. In, in fact, he's accepted it. There's nothing he can do. Can't change the situation. Can't change the circumstances. So he's learned to live with the fact that my son was killed by my son. But the Bible says he longed to be reunited with his son Absalom. And one might say, as the father, he didn't stop loving. Maybe his arms ached for the day when he would be able to embrace his son and say, I love you. 
regardless of what you've done, I still love you. You are still my son. Let's reestablish the relationship and let's move on. The, the irony is that Absalom comes from two Hebrew words, Abba, A-B-B-A, and Shalom. And if you put Abba and Shalom together, Absalom means father of peace or peace with the father. It's almost a paradox. But every day that David as the father, not the king, David as the father, every day he's mourning for his son. In the household there is no peace. Instead of shalom, things are not the way they ought to be. A place that is supposed to be home where people and dreams flourish becomes a place where a father's heart is broken and the son is estranged from his dad. And after being away for three years, Absalom comes back, or being away for two years, he comes back to Jerusalem. And for two years, he had not seen the face of his dad. And yet there are indications in Scripture that Absalom wanted to see his dad. He longed to be with his dad. And for a total of five years, he doesn't see the face of his father. He wanted to be with dad. And Joab was a man of respect. And Absalom felt, if I could get Joab's attention and talk with him, maybe he can be a bridge builder. Maybe he can go to my father and say to him, David, your son wants to be reconciled. Your, your, your son is lonely and weary and empty and destitute for fellowship and to be reconnected with you. If I could only get Joab to talk to my dad. And, and Absalom tried twice, and, Abs and Joab refused to come. So Absalom did something that was completely out of the ordinary. Joab had great fields of barley. And Absalom felt, well, if the first two occasions didn't get his attention, maybe burning his barley fields will get his, atten his attention. And the fields were lit and, lit, and the barley was burnt, and it got Joab's attention. And Joab came running to Absalom, and here's what happened. He said, I want you to take me or reintroduce me to my father. That's why I set your fields on fire. And, and Absalom said this, now then, I want to see the king's face. And if I am guilty of anything, let him put me to death. That's how desperate. He was in his heart to be reunited with his dad. And so after five years of being separated, Joab finds favor with the king, and the king invites Absalom into the court. And here is what happened. When he arrived, he bowed before the king, and the Bible says, and the king kissed. Absalom. Wow, what a moving scene. When is the last time as a father we actually kissed our kids or we embraced our kids? When is the last time we have congratulated our children on some accomplishment or we were by their side when they made a mistake and we were not judgmental? When is the last time we simply embraced those whom we love and said, I love you with a father's love? In fact, I love you with the love of God. I love you with an agape love. And yet, and yet, through all of the emotions that's going on, there's an undercurrent. You see, 
unbeknown to the father David, this would be a kiss of betrayal on the part of Absalom. It's a kiss that came too late. And now that the son had won over his father, the heart of Absalom was bitter to the point where he is going to rise up in conspiracy against the throne of David, and his dream was to become the king. Wow! You see, the kiss should have been one of reconciliation. It should have been one of peace, one of hope. It should have been a kiss that finally put the past behind and rebuilt broken relationships. But instead, there was a betrayal. And I'm sure within the heart of David, he might have been saying, peace at last. After all, that's what my son's name means. Peace at last. Well, Absalom may have been saying, peace that will never last. His heart is so festered with hatred, he is now going to take it out on his daddy. We know the story of how the conspiracy had worked out. And, and Absalom got in favor with the people, and he manipulated people. And one day an advisor came to Solomon and said to him, and this really tickled the heart of Absalom. They said to Absalom, the hearts of the people of Israel are with Absalom. Now, when this came to David, by the way, the message came to David that the hearts of the men of Israel are with Absalom. Imagine or try to imagine the heart of David right now, not only as the king, but as the father. Why, we reconciled, we kissed, we made up, I embraced him. And now he is conspiring to take the kingdom. If David didn't panic at that time, he sure felt a sense of defeat to the point where he said to his officials in Jerusalem, come, we must flee or none of us will escape Absalom. This great man of God, this man after God's own heart, this man who the anointing of the Holy Spirit was on, This man who had just embraced his son and loved him and forgave him is saying, we will not escape from Absalom, my son, Absalom. And he goes on to say, we must leave immediately. We will move, or he will move quickly to overtake us and bring ruin upon us and put the city to the sword. What a tragic turn of events. Should not that one-time kiss have fixed it all? Why, when the prodigal son returned to his father and the father saw his son way off in the distance, the father ran, embraced him, kissed him, forgave him, threw a huge party in his honor for his son who was dead is now alive. And there was celebration in the household of the father. But the kiss by the king, I want you to hear this, the kiss by the king may have reached the lips of Absalom, but it never reached into his heart. There was a blockage between his mental capacities and the emotions of his will and his heart that the kiss could not penetrate. And to make the narrative a little shorter, the battle lines have been drawn. The armies are assembled. And David, now speaking as a father, says to Joab, be gentle with the young man Absalom for my sake. I know he's rebelled against me. 
I know he's, he's killed my son. He's violated my daughter. And I know that he is prepared to take even my life as the king. But he said, be gentle. Be gentle. The heart of the father. If the kiss wasn't too late, what a difference it would make. The battle had been fought. 20,000 lives had been taken that day, and the king was more than a conqueror. And his son, Absalom, trying to escape the carnage of the moment, got all tangled up with his long, beautiful, flowing hair, got caught up in, in, in the branches of an oak tree. And when he was discovered, it was reported back to Joab. And Joab had gone and plunged three javelins into the heart of Absalom so that the uprising might cease. The news comes back to David. He heard, remember when he heard about the death of his son Amnon, he was furious. When he hears about the death of Absalom, the Bible says he was shaken. The very emotions of this great, powerful man were shaken within him because this is a son that he loved. And I would even suppose that David would have laid down his life for his own son. And to conclude the story, when the news had gotten back to the king, the Bible says that David cried out, Oh, my son Absalom. Try and, try and picture what's happening here. Oh, my son Absalom. If only I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son. My son. Today, I want to suggest that our kiss of reconciliation with our children should never be too late. This need not have happened, but it did, and we learn from the consequences. Today, I want to wish you well. I want that the Word of God speak into your heart today. And fathers, I want us to stand tall as daddies, and I want us to be there for our sons, for our daughters, for our wives, for our grandchildren. And God's grace is more than sufficient. Thanks for listening. God bless you. We'll see you in a little while. Amen. This December, the Chetwin Communication Society made wonderful donations in the Peace Region. <laughs> Using our bingo funds, a total of $263,918 was donated to six organizations. And it gives me great pleasure to make this presentation. Yeah. No, thank you for what you do. I'd like to thank you for what you do in the community. It is great. Really good. You're more than welcome. Glad to be able to do it. Thank you for me and my team. Well, you're more than welcome, and it's uh, it's something that is much needed. And thanks for the service you do. Thank you. 
You're more than welcome. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be able to do this. We're also thrilled to be awarding $75,000 in bursaries to post-secondary students. None of this would have been possible without Leo Sobolski, all of our staff, our mascot, and more importantly, you, our amazing bingo players. We would like to wish everyone happy bingo days and... Merry Christmas! <laughs>
while many kids may or may not realize it right away. This stage of their journey is crucial. It's at this level where they can begin to develop the type of habits that will determine if this sport will become a lifelong hobby or a professional career. Who's usually the fastest? Easton. You're a fast man. Is that true? Why are you so fast? While having a winning mentality and being fast are great building blocks to a rider's success, every now and then, every sport sees an athlete whom God has also gifted with vision. Take me through the track. What do you remember of the track? Um, the starting line, you go the, the straight stretch, a corner, little straight stretch, corner, straight stretch, corner, table, corner, table, table, Corner, single, uh, triple, uh, single, corner, tabletop, straight stretch, corner, table, doesn't go recognized very often is that she's a support for us. Uh, sometimes we go to a lot of calls that take a toll on us uh, where we can only be strong for so long and there's a lot of PTSD in first responders and Leanne's a very good resource for us. They just don't know how and sometimes it's just a couple hours here and there that could be making a change for somebody's life and I think that's great. So victim yeah. services is a great asset for us because um, specifically Leanne, like she said, she gets, she's on call, so she'll get a call out at 3 in the morning and sometimes she'll attend a house with us to deal with And we'll go up where there is, just up the hill here is where my grandma Marceline lived, where I lived and was raised. I'm trying to figure out today, I think we moved here in 1960. Everybody, we squatted up here. We, nobody owned their properties. My grandma, for extra dollars, she used to make hides every day. It, all my life I could remember her making hides. As you can see on the one video, um, this is what she did for extra dollars.
This December, the Chetwin Communication Society made wonderful donations in the Peace Region. Using our bingo funds, a total of $263,918 was donated to six organizations. And it gives me great pleasure to make this presentation. Yeah. No, thank you for what you do. I'd like to thank you for what you do in the community. It is great. That's thank really good. All of us. That's You're best. more than welcome. Glad to be able to do it. Thank you for me and my team. Well, you're more than welcome. And it's, uh, it's something that is much needed. And thanks for the service you do. <laughs> Thank you. You're more than welcome. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be able to do this. We're also thrilled to be awarding $75,000 in bursaries to post-secondary students. None of this would have been possible without Leo Sobolski, all of our staff, our mascot, and more importantly, you, our amazing bingo players. We would like to wish everyone happy bingo days and... Merry Christmas! <laughs>
while many kids may or may not realize it right away, this stage of their journey is crucial. It's at this level where they can begin to develop the type of habits that will determine if this sport will become a lifelong hobby or a professional career. Who's usually the fastest? Easton. You're a fast man. Is that true? Why are you so fast? While having a winning mentality and being fast are great building blocks to a rider's success, every now and then, every sport sees an athlete whom God has also gifted with vision. Take me through the track. What do you remember of the track? Um, the starting line, you go the, the straight stretch, a corner, a little straight stretch, corner, straight stretch, corner, table, corner, table, table, Corner, single, uh, chirp, uh, single, corner, chirp, table, table, tabletop, straight stretch, corner, table, In a town where bitter winters reign and the threat of cabin fever lurks in the shadows, one hero stands to abolish boredom and bring an entire region together. Armed with the powers of fun and community, they stand vigil every winter. Chet TV Bingo! The hero we didn't know we needed, but always wanted. Every Thursday at 7 p.m. Only on Chet TV.